Okay, class, we are now on the third part of the brain. We've done the cerebrum, just finished the diencephalon, and now we're going to do the brain stem, do the cerebellum at the end. So the brain stem, it has three parts to it. Seems like everything has three parts. The cerebrum, what are the three parts of the cerebrum? Cerebral cortex, the white matter, basal nuclei, diencephalon, three parts, thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, brain stem, midbrain, pons, and the medulla oblongata. So let's look at our brain stem. So everything in green here is the brain stem. Here was our diencephalon, just inferior to the diencephalon will be the first part of the brain stem, the midbrain. Then we'll have the pons, this big bump here, and lastly will be the medulla oblongata, which is continuous with the spinal cord. So here's a nice color-coded picture for you. Everything in green is the brain stem, here we see the midbrain right here, just inferior to your diencephalon. What is this? This is part of the diencephalon, just for review. Pineal gland, choroid plexus of the third ventricle. This is your thalamus, interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus, infundibulum connected to the pituitary gland. So that you've got down pat, that you know. So this first part here is the midbrain. This is the pons, I call it the pregnant pons because it looks like a big pregnant belly right there. So the pons is there. And then this is going to be the medulla oblongata. So this, remember this is the, the region where we have the third ventricle. This is the cerebral aqueduct. We said the cerebral aqueduct was in the region of the midbrain. So here you see it, the cerebral aqueduct in the mid, in the area of the midbrain. And then we're going to look at we're going to look at these structures here. These are posterior structures. Remember this is posterior. We've got our pineal gland and our cerebellum. Make sure you know where you are and their bumps. We have a top bump and a bottom bump. So we're going to look at these bumps shortly, but let's concentrate on the midbrain. So the midbrain is going to be back in here. It's hard to see. This is a ventral view of the, the brain, the human brain. This is the frontal lobe. We'll get to these shortly. This is the olfactory nerve. This is cranial nerve one. So smelling nerve is right there. So that's kind of cool that you can see it. So frontal lobe. So this is the front. This is going to be the, be the midbrain. Here is the pons, big pons. And here's the medulla oblongata. Gosh, why do I have so many pictures of the midbrain? I guess just to make sure you know exactly where the midbrain is. And it's part of the brain stem. So here's an up close of a real brain. So again, this was the diencephalon. Here is the midbrain. So here's the midbrain. Here is that cerebral aqueduct. Easy to see. The big pons is below. You cannot see it right here, but there are two bumps right here. So we're going to get to those. I hope the next slide we get to those. No, not yet. I got another picture. Here we go again. Here is the cerebral aqueduct. Some places will call it the aqueduct of the midbrain. Here are those bumps. You can see them. There's a bump on the top and the bump on the bottom. So there's two bumps in each cerebral hemisphere so there's going to be four bumps total so now let's look at them 
So remember, these are posterior structures, these, these bumps. We are calling the four bumps the corpora, quad, ri, gem, ina, quadrigemina. Quad means four. So we have a body of four structures. This is a sheep brain. This is a human brain. So on the sheep brain, here's the occipital lobes. Here's the pineal gland that belong to the diencephalon. Remember your pineal gland that goes towards the back? So this is towards the back, and here's your cerebellum. So when you pull down the cerebellum, you're able to see these four bumps real clear on a sheep brain. These two top bumps are called the superior colliculi. Superior colliculi of the corpora quadragemina. And then there's two smaller bumps here. These are called the inferior colliculi of the corpora quadragemina. On a human brain, here's the thalamus up in here. Here's going to be the area of the third ventricle. Here is our corpora quadragemina. We got our four bumps the two superior colliculi, and the two inferior colliculi. You'll notice there, the superiors are much bigger in a sheep, and we'll go over that shortly why. So what do these guys do? These, these ha are bodies. These have nuclei in them. What does nuclei mean in the CNS? A collection of neuron cell bodies. So these nuclei are going to be doing something. So the superior colliculi allows for the rapid initiation of motor responses to incoming sensory information. What the heck does that mean? So let me give you an example. You're walking along. It's kind of getting dark at night. And out of the periphery of your vision, you see a shadow. You don't hear anything, but you see a shadow. Automatically, your eyes that you are going to turn to that visual cue that you you just saw. You're not thinking about it. That is just an automatic response. That's what it means. Rapid initiation of a motor response. That motor response is your eyes and your neck, your head turning to see that visual information that coming in that's visual sensory information i should put incoming visual it's a visual reflex center visual reflex center so superior colliculite visual reflex centers and you've probably seen that before too when you're maybe you're you're sitting down and you just see maybe something move in your peripheral vision like a little mouse or a rat you, you are your attention is going to be grabbed to whatever you just saw that is a visual reflex that is coming from the superior colliculi now the inferior colliculi these have auditory reflexes so here it tells you it's important for identifying the location of sound in space in or orienting your body towards such sounds. What does that mean? <laughs> it means if you hear a sound, you, you can usually process your, you can process where that sound is coming from in space. So if you hear a loud boom behind you, these inferior colliculi are going to be able to tell that that sound is coming from behind you and normally you are going to have a motor response to that sound too you'll turn to that sound i hear a sound behind me i i am going to turn towards it what where what is that sound where is it coming from so that is an auditory reflex so superior colliculi visual reflexes um, inferior colliculi, auditory reflexes. <clears throat> Think of, always remember, superior eyes are above your ears. 
So you know visual is above auditory. Now in the sheep, there is lots of things that want to kill sheep. There's a lot of animals that are going to be preying on these poor sheep. So they have a huge superior colliculi because they need to have the, that motor response of running away. I see it. I need to run away. That's why theirs is so much larger than ours. So those are the qu qu corpora quadragemina. So those are the only really things you need to know in the midbrain other than the cerebral aqueduct where the CSF is flowing in the midbrain. So on to the pons, this pregnant pons. So here's the pons. What do I want you to know about it? Not much. All you really need to know, pons is the bridge. It is a bridge between um, the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord below it. A bridge um, between the, the midbrain and the cer cerebrum above it. And a bridge to the cerebellum, which is posterior to it. So it's going to have a lot of nerve fibers, axons, that are communicating with all these areas. That is all I want you to know about the pons. So this is your classroom brain model, and this is on your worksheet. So for, by now, you should have almost everything labeled. So now we know this is the brain stem. This part is the midbrain. Here is the superior colliculi, inferior colliculi. Actually, this is the superior colliculus because there's only one. Inferior colliculus because there's only one. Colliculi is plural, but you're only seeing half of them. Um, here is the pons right here. And now we're going to go on to this lower portion of our brain stem the medulla oblongata. Now, the medulla oblongata, we're just going to call it the medulla. Very, very important. And we'll tell you why. And number one, you need to know the medulla is just, it's going to continue down un uninterrupted with the spinal cord. So, you already know that the spinal cord starts where? At the the area of the foramen magnum. And we're going to talk about another area right at that intersection of the spinal cord and the medulla. Talk about that shortly. What you need to know. The medulla consists of vital nuclei and white matter that forms all the ascending and descending communicating tracts between the spinal cord and various parts of the brain. So real important, and we'll talk about these. First, we're going to talk about the vital nuclei. What does vital mean? It means you have to have them or you will die. That's what that means. What are nuclei? Collection of cell bodies in the CNS, lots of gray matter. So we're going to have these lot of cell bodies in the medulla that are controlled, controlling vital things. They control respiration, your heartbeat, your blood pressure, um, actions such as swallowing, coughing, vomiting. But these were all structures that were controlled by the hypothalamus, right? We said the hypothalamus was controlling homeostasis, right? So what's up with the medulla? It sounds like it's doing the same thing. Yeah, but it is the hypothalamus that is telling the medulla to carry out these vital functions. So basically the hypothalamus is the boss. It's telling these vital nuclei in the medulla what to do, and the medulla does it. So that's that explanation.
So remember, vital nuclei, very important. And I want to talk about this, anesthesia and medullary depression. Medullary depression, where we are not, the medulla is not being, doesn't have depression in the sense of depression, of a state of depression. It's being suppressed. It cannot function properly. Why is this important? Well, there is a drug called propofol. Now, propofol is what killed Michael Jackson, if you guys remember who Michael Jackson is and how he died. So, this drug that Michael Jackson was using for his chronic insomnia, it is an injectable drug that is only allowed to be used in a hospital under the guidance of an anesthesiologist, not to be given at home, at home, which is what happened with Michael Jackson. And I'm just going to kind of read what propofol does. The biggest dosage, dosage problem with propofol is that if too much is given too quickly, even if it's in the right amount in terms of the total dose, but is administered too quickly, you can end up with a patient that is not breathing very well or may stop breathing. That's called apnea. And if you expect the side effect and a medical professional is there to prepare to is prepared to deal with it, it does not present a problem. But in Michael Jackson's case, he was given the drug because he has chronic insomnia and he liked his propofol and he got some quack doctor to give it to him. The doctor left Michael's room for 20 minutes at least. We They know that because of the <clears throat> phone calls, phone call records. And when he came back, Michael Jackson was dead. He had stopped breathing. So what happens when we have medical med medullary depression? from this anesthesia, this propofol. And they use propofol to put people to sleep all the time when they're doing surgery. Medullary depression. It lowers, refers to the lower centers of the brain, and we're talking about the medulla, those vital nuclei that are responsible for things you don't have to think about, like keeping your heart going, blood pressure regulation, and all the other body functions that maintain us in a normal state of health. And they, those normally just happen automatically. The hypothalamus, that's part of our autonomic nervous system. And it is telling the medulla, those vital nuclei in the, in the medulla, to do, do these critical things in our body to keep us alive. So... If you if you cannot regulate your blood pressure, you can't not regulate your breathing, you can't maintain blood pressure, you can't maintain a heart rate, you will have a dead patient. And that is what happened to Michael Jackson. Medullary depression from propofol. Now, the medulla also has something else that's real important clinically too. It has what we call pyramids. Now this is the anterior surface. Here's the pons. This is the anterior surface of the medulla and we're going to see right down the middle here. This is actually called the anterior median sulcus that's separating these two ridges. These ridges are called pyramids. So you can see these ridges. Here you can see it better. These are pyramids, these long ridges. Here's the median, anterior median um, sulcus, and here's a pyramid on this side. So we have pyramids on both sides. And what is traveling in these pyramids? all the somatic motor fibers that are passing down from the brain 
from the precentral gyrus. Remember your precentral gyrus in your frontal lobe. All those somatic motor fibers are going to the py pyramids and the medulla oblongata. And then from the medulla oblongata, it will send it down to the spinal cord. So I'll show you a picture of that and hopefully it'll make more sense. But basically, all those somatic motor fiber tracks coming down from the brain are going to be traveling down these pyramids and they're going to go on to the somatic motor neuron cell body in the spinal cord to carry out your skeletal muscle action. Got all that? Well, let's just add another piece of information. There is an area where we have what we call decusation of the pyramids, also called motor decusation. Decusation just means the crossing over. What is crossing over? These somatic motor fibers, nerve fibers. So here is the pyramid. Here, are, here they're showing you the decusation of pyramids. Doesn't mean anything to you yet. I'll show you another picture of uh, what's going on. So we are going to look at this decusation. What does it mean it's crossing over? Now there's going to be a tract, a tract that's coming down from the brain, from the, the pre-central gyrus that's carrying all these motor fibers that are going to be coming down. And that tract is called the corticospinal tract. What does that word mean? Cortical, coming from the cerebral cortex, going to the spinal cord, and it's a tract. What is the definition of a tract? Axons traveling to similar destinations they form axon bundles called tracks. So we are going to be looking at this cortical spinal tract that is carrying somatic motor fibers, nerve fibers, axons from the precentral gyrus. Got that? I hope. So let's look at it. So, cortical spinal tract. Remember, these motor tracts, they are descending tracts. And the major descending tract that controls skeletal muscle movement is the cortical spinal tract. So, here is our precentral gyrus up here. So, remember your precentral gyrus? of your frontal lobe. Yes, this is your primary motor cortex. Yes, Con controlling what? All your skeletal muscle. Yes, that's all review. So we, here we have our precentral gyrus and here we're going to have our, what were they, they're gonna call our upper neuron, upper motor neuron. And it has its cell body in that, in your cerebral cortex, in that precentral gyrus. This upper motor neuron, it's, it's a interneuron, but they're calling it an upper motor neuron because it is only sending down motor, motor commands. So, so far so good. So we have our upper motor neuron cell bodies that are in our precentral gyrus, which is our somatic motor, controlling our somatic motor, um, our skeletal muscles. They're, they're getting a command. They're going to send that motor command down, down. They're going to cross through the internal capsule. Remember, everything has to cross through that internal capsule. It's going to go down through into the midbrain. 
it's coming down. Now we're in the medulla. This is the medulla. Here is the pyramid on this side. Let's say this is the right side. So these are right-sided. It's coming from the right side of your brain. They're coming down, going to the midbrain, going down through this pyramid of the medulla, the right pyramid of the medulla, and the, all those axons are going to be crossing over. And it's going to be crossing over, going into the lateral part of the spinal cord on the opposite side. So now we are on the left side of the spinal cord. We're going to descend down on that cortical spinal tract. We are going to then synapse this axon from our upper motor neuron is going to synapse with our lower motor neuron, which is our somatic motor neuron, down in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. Yes. So the axon from this somatic motor neuron will then lead through the ventral root into the spinal nerve, and those commands will be sent to the spinal nerve to wherever muscle it needs to go. If you don't understand that, watch watch this part of the video again. It's pretty simple. This is all going to som somatic skeletal muscles, the precental gyrus. So this is um, an easier way to look at it. If this is our right side of the brain, here's our left side of the brain. So here's our right side of the brain. So if we have our, this is our precental gyrus, and these are going to be the first motor neuron, the upper motor neuron. It's going to send information down from the cortex. It's going to go through the internal capsule deep within the cerebrum. It's going to go down the, the brain stem. When it gets down to this area of the medulla where we of the the medulla where we have our pyramids, we are going to have the ducusation of the pyramids, the crossing over is happening right there. There's the X crossing over. So basically this is telling you if this is the right side of the brain, the right side of the brain is controlling the left side of your body. So if you are having a stroke, like Dr. Jill Bolte, she had a stroke on her left side, left side of her brain. Her symptoms were showing up on her right side. She had right-sided muscle weakness. So clinically, this ducusation in the pyramids that is happening in the pyramids you know what the pyramids are again, and you know what ducusation is, you know what is ducusating. These motor, motor fibers that are coming down from the, the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex of the brain, those motor fibers that are giving information, that are going to be sending that information to your somatic motor neuron down the spinal cord. Those nerve fibers are crossing over. So hopefully that makes sense. Now I wanted to end with this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of ALS. Am amotrophic lateral sclerosis. A means without, myo means muscle, trophic. Trophic just means it shrivels up, it atrophies. So this is basically a shriveling up of muscles. And this is a progressive nervous system disease. And what is happening, the motor neuron cells, either in the brain, in that precentral gyrus, those motor neuron cells are being destroyed or damaged or 
in the spinal cord, in the in the ventral um, ventral gray horn of the spinal cord. Those somatic motor neurons, or they could all both be being destroyed. But basically, you are killing off motor neuron cells in the brain and the spinal cord. ALS, also called Lou Gehrig's disease. If you don't know who Lou Gehrig was, he was a famous baseball player that died from this. Now, a ALS is its a death sentence, and normally these patients die within two to five years, except for this guy. Stephen Hawkins. He was born, actually, on my birthday, um, and he died, look at that, I think, what is that, 76 years old. He lived with ALS for about 50 years, and towards the end, he, I mean, he, he couldn't talk, he couldn't breathe, he was on a ventilator, he, he had a machine that talked for him, he couldn't move any muscle in his body except for one little muscle that was left towards the end. So I wanted to show you this little video clip that shows you the early symptoms and how they diagnosed his disease. Well, <clears throat> I had uploaded this piece of the video and I got a copyright hold on my video. So, geez, trying to show students what happens when you have ALS and a motor neuron disease, they took my video down. So, I'm going to see if maybe I can just show you this part of the film. It's only like a, a, a couple of minutes. It's just showing you the di how they, the early symptoms that um, Stephen Hawkins had with his motor neuron disease and basically how they diagnosed it. And this whole movie goes through his life. And he was diagnosed in his 20s with ALS. So, you know, I really do hope you can watch this movie if you have time. It's a great movie to watch, The Theory of Everything. So he just died in 2000, in 2018. So he lived 76 years, which was amazing. Most people die in two to, two to five years, like I already said. But this disease does not affect the mind other than the somatic motor control. He lost um, essentially all his skeletal muscle um, control. There was no skeletal muscle signals going to his, his skull, his voluntary skeletal muscles anymore. A slowly progressive disease. Can you even imagine being such a brilliant man and knowing your muscles are leaving you? Especially once it got to his speech, he couldn't even talk. He talked through a machine that they invented just for him. And here's the doctor basically telling him that he has a motor neuron disease. There is no cure. It's progressive and you will die. And there's basically nothing they can do for him. There is no cure. And so he's taking all this in, and what he asks is, what about my mind? What about my brain? And he's basically saying, your brain will be spared. What about my brain? What are, your brain will be spared, and you will have thoughts. 
but you won't be able to communicate those thoughts because he would lose his speech, his ability to speak, his ability to write, his ability to do everything to express those inner thoughts. So, devastating. So, just so when you think you are having a bad day, think about what this man went through. Didn't it affect his brain? He, he, his brain, he was brilliant. Brilliant man that did so much in his life. It makes me want to cry. Anyway... See, now I'm crying. Oh my gosh. But watch the movie. It's a great, great movie. Um, show you the progression of his disease. It's amazing. Anyway, on to the cerebellum, our last part of the amazing brain.